Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great coming in and seeing it, you know, greeted at the door and people with their uh, eyes wide open and smile on their face, and uh, I get it, you know, because it wasn't always like that in my experience. I never always feel felt like uh, happy, you know, and I was thinking today, I'm going to, first thing, I want to thank the group for asking me to come and speak. Uh, it's definitely an honor and a privilege to be able to do anything like this for Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, I don't enjoy it as much as I used to. Um, I used to like to hear myself talk. Um, can you guys relate to that? You know, I uh, would much rather sit with somebody in my apartment and uh, just go over some stuff, go over our, our book and, and do that stuff, you know. But uh, anytime I get to do stuff like this, it's definitely an honor and a privilege, whether it's in front of 100 people or, or five people or one person. Um, but thank to Sarah and the group for having me come out and speak. I want to thank my friend Zach for taking the ride from Philadelphia. Didn't hit much traffic on the uh, expressway. You know, thank you, God. So we got here early. And, uh, yeah. So that's that. But uh, I was thinking today, which is never a good thing. <laughs> and uh, I was actually in Quakertown earlier in the day. I was actually in Hilltown, which is not far from Quakertown. I was working, doing my thing, and uh, normal Monday morning, you know, uh, thinking, <laughs> pondering. And uh, at times there's no peace with that. But uh Anyway, I'm working, and, and, and I happened to see a person who I hadn't seen in 17 years. It was a girl that I had dated in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, and uh, it didn't go well, you know, and uh, had an opportunity to make a face-to-face amends with this woman. And uh, years ago, I had reached out, and I didn't know where she was at, and, you know, I was told to pray, and uh, God will put her in my life when he seems fit, you know, and today was one of those days where... I was in the area, and uh, she moved out of Philadelphia years ago, and she's in uh, this area. And I just happened to run into her, and and I don't see that as coincidence today, you know. Uh, God was doing for me. I asked him for strength, you know, show me a sign or whatever. I I called it. I just, and and he just, boom, she's there, you know. And uh, I was able not only to set things right, but uh, shed some light on the uh, nature of alcoholism. She has a brother who's suffering at this moment. He's moving in with her. So I was able to share my experience with her and and what I've come to find to be true and what I suffer from and just giving her some information, passing along. uh, If he wants to call or not, that's up to him or her. But, you know, to be available at that moment and not be consumed with me, you know, and and that's just what it boils down to. You know, I I get up on, on a daily basis and I ask God, keep me free from myself, you know, and that, and that is my problem, me. Right, my thinking mind, the way I view the world, the way I view others, and that's why I struggle. That's why I struggled in the past, and even in sobriety. If I don't watch out for certain things, you know, I'm a prey to misery and depression. Sober, you know, thinking about life and others, and why is it not the way I want it to be, and everything else. And uh, you know, we do have an answer to that, you know, and there's certain things I must do in order to uh, alleviate certain things, you know, and it's only through practice and repetition um, and it's certain disciplines that uh, I'm able to do these things and not be as much uh, jammed up when it comes to certain things, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I'm not going to get into a lot of that right now. I will in a little bit, but uh, our book tells me what I'm supposed to do in a general way, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. I'm going to try not to get metaphysical up here. I'm going to just relate my story to, to, to alcohol and how I came to find a power greater than myself. That's it. Anything else is great. You know, you want to talk to me on the side. But, I, you know, certain things, you know, I try to keep, you know, clear cut and, and there's no need for it. You know, if it comes out, it comes out. But, uh, you know, my this is my job up here tonight is to share that and hopefully – you know, somebody that uh, has not found this way of life might be open to uh, to, to, to walking with us. But uh, my childhood gets better the longer I stay sober. You know what I mean? Like, I'll tell you that. Like, 
my perception, obviously, our perception changes with things. And the way I used to view my younger years and the way I see it today, it's changed. You know what I mean? I know my parents did the best for what with, with what they had. I know that now, right? But you could have asked me five years ago, and I would have told you that that's the reason why I drink is because of this. It's because of that. My parents divorced. I didn't feel love. Whatever it, it would have been, I would have told you that was the reason why I was who I was. Why I turned out or how, or, I don't ask that question anymore. I am, and, and I have something to, uh, a, a way of uh, treating that. You know, all that other stuff, the psychology behind it, whatever, I don't even entertain anymore. You know what I mean? It's just, it's it's not worth it. But uh and like I just mentioned, my parents divorced when I was young, and I went back and forth between my mom and my dad's place. And uh, I had the things that kids had. You know, I had, a, I had a stable home, food on the table. You know, I saw my dad on the weekends. But I can tell you, even at an early age, and like I said, I, I like to look back at times, and I just never felt content, right? I mean, I've heard that shared a million times. I just didn't feel a part of. I felt like something was missing. And I'm no different than anybody else that, that said that, or I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. And uh, where does that come from? Again, I don't care, all right? I just had it. And uh, I didn't know at the time. So growing up, you know, I would try to fit in. And, and I did things that other kids do. Played sports, had friends, uh, did okay in school when I tried, you know. And uh, my parents, like I said, when they divorced, Things changed a lot uh, when I went back to my mom's. And I can tell you, the first time I found alcohol, like I grew up in an Italian family, so alcohol was present, Sundays, dinners, you know, a little bit of wine. That was no big deal. I never had an effect produced by alcohol at an early age. But started hanging out with kids that, that's what kids do, you know what I mean? Like they drank, you know. So I can tell you one night I had made a decision that I was going to hang out with the friends again. I was like 14, 15 years old, and I was going to get drunk this night. Like, I had made it a purpose to drink and uh, get drunk, and that's what I did, right? We're in the woods. Um, I'm from Delco, Delaware County, south of Philadelphia, and that's what we did. We drank in the woods, and I'll never forget it. We had a party ball, Coors Light, and uh, hanging out, girls and guys, and I, I don't know how much I drank, but I can tell you this. I uh, got drunk. I threw up and I went home stumbling that night and I just, I loved everything about it. Even the throwing up. I didn't, for, for me, I didn't have a good night unless I puked. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, I know you're laughing because you can relate to that. Like I would push the envelope even at an early age. Like I saw no reason to just have a drink. Like what alcohol did for me at that moment, at that time, I saw no reason not to get to that point every time I drank. Because it just took everything away, right? The first 14, 15 years of my life, I feel like I'm uncomfortable. And I know most kids are uncomfortable at early years. I'm no different than, than average kids, right? But uh, something, again, happened that night where I felt at peace, comfortable. I could be myself, not worrying about what he or she says. And uh, it was it was great, you know what I mean? And that is a very powerful thing. And... Uh, you know, when I talk to guys today, like, the thing is, like, at that, that moment, at, at 15 years old, the, what alcohol did for me, I can't sugarcoat, you know? And then when I don't have that, I need something else to replace it, you know what I mean? That ease and comfort that I had gotten at such a young age where everything was okay, you know? And, I, and like I said, for the first 15 years of my life, I just felt like I couldn't even breathe, right? I've been holding my breath my whole life. And at this moment, I'm able to breathe. Like, things are okay. You know, and that's all I ever wanted was that feeling of everything's okay and felt comfortable and content with who I was, you know, and alcohol did that for me. Didn't start drinking every day. Didn't start experiencing consequences. Did whatever kids do. I went, I went to school, graduated high school. Like I said, I did sports, half heartily. I never really applied myself to my full potential. You know what I mean? I could have been somebody, I guess, you know, whether it was uh, in school or athletically, 
I just didn't they just didn't have the, the the attention or wanted to. Like I said, at 15, I found this thing. It was cool. It gave me comfort. And little did I know that this is something I was going to pursue. Like, I guess kids in high school, you know, they have a five-year plan, four-year, five-year plan, you know, to go to college, you know, to go to some higher education. That wasn't, that never entered my mind. Like, that never entered my mind once. School was just a drag. You know, I got through school, high school, average grades, never even picking up a book. So, like, you know what I mean? We're not dumb people in here, you know? It says it in our book. When it comes to other things, we do well, right? But it just, it seems like I struggle. I have this problem when it comes to alcohol. Other things I do, you know, and I can do pretty good. But, uh, like I said, this other thing I never, never knew about, I needed to get a grip on. So, um, hanging out with the, uh, the cool kids, you know, comes along with certain things. And, and I, like, I'm just going to say in passing, I graduated to other uh, non-AA approved substances. We'll leave it at that. I, I, don't, need to get, I don't need to get in any detail in, in what I did. And, and I've come to find out it doesn't even matter. You know, whatever it is you do, you're welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I relate to my story to alcohol out of respect for our traditions. Um, I can tell you whatever it is I would do if it was free, <laughs> you know, even better. You know, so with that whole thing being said, you know, I'm just going to say that in passing, but, uh, hanging out with the crowd that does other stuff comes certain things, you know, and, uh, went to go back to live with my father and went to go work for the family business. Now I'm 18 years old, driving around in, in a nice car for an 18 year old kid, making decent money, no responsibilities, partying on the weekends, uh, hanging out with the friends on the weekends, partying and all that stuff. And I had this, this, just this thought that, like Bill says in his story, that I had arrived. Like, I'm so, so selfish and so conceited. Like, 18 years old, I think I have the world in front of me and I'm going to conquer it. Like, nothing can touch me. Like, I had this thought process and, uh, it's dangerous. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, that went downhill quickly, that thought process. Like, I'm the go getter and I got everything under control. And I didn't know the nature of our illness. I don't know the progression at 18 years old. I don't know what I'm in the store for. I don't know in a few short years that I'll be homeless, running the streets of Kensington like a lunatic. You know, I wasn't raised to do that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a good person by by my... Well, I'm not a good person, to be honest with you. My My, <laughs> my nature is selfish and self-centered. So, But you know what I'm saying, guys. Like That wasn't going to be part of... You know, me growing up, I never saw myself, you know what I mean, uh, But living this lifestyle. But like I said, I'm not letting that go, what alcohol does for me. I'm not letting that go easily. I'm just not. And I'll hold on to the bitter end, and you'll end up burying me. Or worse, I'll be locked up for 20 years. Or, or even worse, I'll be just living for the next 25 years just hurting people, you know what I mean, which is what happens with active alcoholism. Um so where am I going with this? Um, I'm going to fast forward. I'm not going to get into certain details. Like, just imagine this. I'm in my first treatment center at 22 years old, okay? And uh, for the next 10 years, I'm in and out of treatment centers. I'm in and out of detoxes, mental hospitals. Um, my d d disease is progressing. And I just, I'm not letting this thing go, you know, and I hear, you know, and, and thank God for treatment centers. They did what they were supposed to do. They got me off the stuff. They got me a little bit physically stable, mentally stable. And they, and they set me off and they told me what to do. Go to a meeting, find a sponsor, work the 12 steps, right? <laughs> it's not the answer I'm looking for though. It's just not. See, I, I hear stuff, but I don't really hear it. You know what I mean? When I'm consumed with myself, you can tell me straight to my face the truth that, listen, we have an answer. We have a solution for you. It's right here. And it just goes in one ear out the other. Because, again, I have all these – I was talking to Sarah before the meeting. I have all these ideas and these prejudices about everything. I have an opinion on everything, and it sucks because there's no peace in that. Like, to think that I know, and I love to set aside prayer, 
that we read before the meeting tonight, we read that down in, in a lot of the meetings in Philadelphia. To not know is, is a true liberation. And I can say most days I try to stay in that mindset where I don't know. I mean, I know certain things when it comes to the book I can show you. But other than that, I don't know. I don't know what God has in store for you. You know, I, didn't, I just don't know. And, it, and like I said, it's a lot it's a lot more freeing to say that than to try to know and to try to, to make things happen and control certain things. Um, so I go to these treatment centers and these detoxes, you know, and I was told you need to get away from Philadelphia. You need to get, get away from people, places and things. And I, I did that, you know, I went to Maryland to a prestigious halfway house, cost my family thousands of dollars. What happens? I go to this place and, uh, I take myself with me, this selfish, self-centered person, and uh, which is it's in my, all in my mind. And I take this to Maryland, and I, and, I, and this is my track record. Uh, I do okay in the beginning. Like I'm a good starter. Like I can start things, but I'm not a good finisher. I get a few months, I get a chip, and I, I'm back out the door. You know what I mean? No, no, no work. No understand. Not not wanting to know. Just want to hang out. Just want to try to figure this thing out. And what happens is I get drunk again. And that just went on and on and on for a long time, you know. And I, I move out of Maryland. I move back up to Pennsylvania. And I go to another treatment center. And then I move up to Scranton, Pennsylvania, you know, to another prestigious halfway house. Like, that is going to get me better. You know what I mean? And uh, it's just the beginning, you know what I mean? And I had a sponsor in Scranton. And uh, he had tried to do work with me. You know, he always would say, how you doing on that four-step, Jeff? Eh, I'm, I got to go tanning, and I got to go to the gym, and I'm busy working, selling cars, you know. It's just everything else. And that's the story of my life is if I can just fix the outside stuff, if I can get you to think that I'm okay, that you see me as okay, that I'm good. Like, that's all I want is is is... The way I want you to think about me is the most important thing in my life. And as long as I look okay, then then I'm okay, right? And that's a lie because, again, I can wear – I don't wear shirts and ties anymore, but I'm working in Scranton, selling cars, making a ton of money, walk, walking around, a shirt and tie to work. And if you saw me on the outside driving an $80,000 demo, you'd be like, man, this guy's got it going on. But if you truly knew how I was doing, I was dying internally just dying, a shell of a human being, full of fear, not wanting to, to live, but not knowing any other way other than just to get up and struggle again the next day. You know what I mean? And if I can just get another day sober, everything's going to be okay. You know what I mean? Striving for midnight, like that was my goal to get another day. You know what I mean? And there's no peace in that. You know what I mean? And I had to just stop, you know, stop, stop it. And uh, that's a concept that I couldn't do either. Just stop, you know what I mean? And just uh, stop the struggle, you know what I mean? But uh, five years in Scranton was enough. I had burned enough bridges up there, you know what I mean? And uh, in and out, you know, AA. And I'm trying to be a good member of AA. I'm trying to do the things that you guys are telling me to do, right? I have a sponsor. I'm making meetings. I have a home group. I'm chairing meetings, right? I just felt like something was missing. I don't know. I couldn't put my finger on it. And I just, I, I saw people and there was always that guy, that old guy had, that always had a smile on his face, always talking about the steps, always talking about the big book. And he was a guy I stood, uh, I, I stayed away from. I don't know why. Did I, I felt threatened maybe, or I, maybe he saw me for who I really was. I don't, I don't know what the case may be. I just, Something about him scared me, you know what I mean? The light that I saw in this man, I wanted it so bad, but I wasn't willing to do what it took to get that. You know what I mean? I'm, I I want to get this thing and, and don't do anything and be better. <laughs> like, that's my goal. I just want to be happy, joyous, and free and not do anything. It doesn't work like that, you know? And, and again, and it's only my experience that I'm sharing up here, guys. Everybody has a, uh, a different road, you know, to the same path. And uh, this is mine, you know. So it took the constant struggle, the constant falling flat on my face, running back to mom and dad, running back to the to the treatment centers, running back to the rehabs. It, it, it took that for me 
to be at this point right here, right now, where I'm able to share my experience with, uh, with the, with the program for Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, um, moved out of Phil, uh, Scranton in 08, moved back, you know, and, and, and during this time, I, uh, had a child, you know, and he's 15 years old, just celebrated a birthday, and I would come back and forth from Scranton to Delaware County to see him every other weekend, and I tried to the best of my ability to be the best father that I could be, you know, and it's more than just paying child support. I know that today, you know, just because, you know, that, that, you know, that's important too, but there's a lot more being a father than just sending him a weekly check, you know, and, uh, through the last few years through, you know, the program Alcoholics Anonymous, I have my son in my life more, you know, and, uh, things are working out to where he might be coming with me, uh, full time. You know, and that's only through the grace of God. You know what I mean? I would have never thought that that was possible to have this, this, this young man, you know, and, uh, we have a great relationship. You know what I mean? He, man, I don't know how he does it. You know, he's 15. He plays three sports, honor roll, just a well-rounded kid, man. And it was nothing I did. You know what I mean? And I say that up here with, with no remorse. You know, I know and I'm grateful to the people in my life that I felt ill will to growing up, namely my family, you know, and other people that are uh, positive in his life that played such a huge role. And I'm, 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 I'm blessed beyond belief to have that experience with my son today, you know, and uh, thank you, AA, thank you, God, you know. But uh, so going back and forth, I figured, let me move back to Delco. It's, you know, I was tired of screen. I was tired. I'm just tired. I want to go home, you know. I want to go back to where I grew up. I want to see my son more. And, uh, again, at this point, you know, I, I'm still holding on to some ideas. I, I, I get in a car accident on 95, bad one. I get, it wasn't my fault this time. <laughs> I get rear-ended, you know, by a drunk driver. <laughs> so uh, karma is what it is. Um, I'm okay with that too, but it set off, uh, it set off a, a series of events and I get hurt and it just opens up, you know, the whole other, uh, door for, uh, just, Nut stuff, and I end up in Lancaster. Now, my experience with Lancaster at this point was, uh, I think I, like at this point, I, I, and, I, and I think I'm pretty smart, you know, and, and I think I know what AA is about. And I go to this treatment center in Lancaster, and, you know, I, I, I know this and that, and I don't know anything, right? And I, I just meet these guys, and I'm in this halfway house, and they come in, man, and younger guys. Uh, and they just, they're enthusiastic that I just see something about them. They come in to, to our halfway house with these guys and they're sitting with them with the big book open, just doing some stuff. And I'm like, what is all this about? You know, cause again, I want to be, a, I want to be a part of, right? Ever since I was little, I want to be a part of the group. Like what you're doing, I want to do. <laughs> so I, I'm like, I'm like watching these guys. I'm like, huh. I said, I never really, I never really did that before. Maybe. I think these guys might be on to something. And, uh, so I asked this man to, to sponsor me. He said, yeah. And what happens is, uh, again, uh, self knowledge avails me nothing. Sitting with a sponsor one time, uh, for a person like me is, uh, not enough. <laughs> and I end up getting, getting in trouble in Lancaster. And I look back and it was a blessing in disguise. Like, you know, my experience guys with my past, you know, I never really got in much trouble with the law, you know, and uh, I had my stepfather, who is a police officer, got me in, out of a lot of scrapes growing up with the law. So I always, again, what I had shared earlier, rehabs, detoxes, I get in trouble, I run to them, you know what I mean? I don't do homeless well, so I would last a few weeks on the streets, and I'm like, you know, I need help, please help me, you know, and I go back, mom and dad, whatever. So at this point... You know, uh, I don't know how old I am, 30, 31 years old. Nobody's helping me. <laughs> and I'm in, I'm in a jail cell for nine months in Lancaster County, you know. And looking back, like I said, I didn't find a higher power in jail. I wasn't that guy. You know, uh, I didn't go to the, the DNA block to find spirituality or the big book. I, I didn't want nothing to do with anybody. And I sat in a jail cell by myself for nine months, and uh, it was needed. It was necessary for me to get to that point of hopelessness that the book talks about. Man, looking at myself, feeling that, experiencing that day in and day out, 
that self-loathing, that uh, the fear, it just crippled me. And, 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 and this is where my mindset was getting out of jail. I need to do something, all right? And I have nowhere else to go, right? Parents taking me back those days are long over. 31 years old, 30, 31 years old. I have nothing. And I say, like, I got to do something. Now, my mindset getting out of jail wasn't to get a job. It wasn't to get a car or a girlfriend or to start going back to the gym. None of those thoughts entered my mind. My thought process was this. I think these guys in Lancaster are on to something. And I, I need to get out and find somebody immediately to start working with. It only took 10 years to get to that point. <laughs> I've been hearing it over and over and over. But finally, that was the forefront of my mind was I need help now. Somebody that can sit with me and take me through these 12 steps that I haven't done. I had to look at that, guys. Like, what haven't I done in Alcoholics Anonymous? Uh, the program? <laughs> like, I don't understand. Like, why is it hard for me to realize that? I am so thick-headed and so stubborn that it just didn't come, it didn't compute in my psyche like that. I'm missing something. Yeah, you're missing the program. And, uh, it took, it just took what it took. Not gonna get into all the details. We don't have the time or I don't believe this is the format, but, uh, I met this, I get out, I go to this recovery house and, and I'm gonna fast forward here and I meet this man. And, uh, where do I meet him? Well, I ask God, God, please put somebody in my life that you can, that can help me with the 12 steps. I don't know where that prayer came from. Um, never said it before, but it came out. And uh, what happens? I'm in, a, I'm in a meeting, treatment center, outside meeting, and a big meeting like this, more people, hundreds of people. And uh, there's this man sitting next to me who has a smile on his face. His eyes look like these beacons of light. If, he, if, it, if his eyes were any, wide op any more wide open, they'd be bulging out of his head. He scared me a little bit. But I was like, man, this guy, something's, about, something's up with this. I got to find out. He shares from the floor in front of 200 people that if anybody needs help, that he would be more than willing to help them uh, with the 12 Steps Alcoholics Anonymous. Didn't I just ask God a day or two before? And he's basically going to sit him on my lap. Like I didn't have to go across the room. He was sitting right next to me. So shame on me if I never, if I didn't ask this man for help. He made it that simple, and I did. You know, and my experience, guys, with this whole process, with the 12 steps, the big book, all that good stuff came very easily and smoothly. And it was only a result of the desperation I was in. I didn't question anything this man was showing me. I had no concept, no ideas. He came over. Now, listen, I just got out of jail. I don't want to work. I don't want to find a job. Uh... I don't have anything, so maybe I could fit him into my schedule. <laughs> I'm not that busy. I have I have a lot of openings right now. Like, so you want to come over tomorrow? And he did, you know. And this and this man did what he was supposed to do. He was a vessel. He got me to work. And like I said, we just got to work, man, uh, quickly. You know, I I I didn't have long, guys, because a day or two before. I wanted to drink so bad, I didn't care about going back to jail. I was ready to hop on the bus to take the train to, down to the city and do what I always did. But if the fear of going back to jail, there was that small fear kept me sober maybe for a few hours. I know today that wouldn't have worked uh, that long because it never did. But for that moment, I was scared to death. I wanted to do something different, and I just let this man show me what he had experienced. And like I said, I didn't question anything. I had no more ideas left on how I was going to run my life. He told me to read, I read. He told me to write, I wrote. And that was that simple. Like, wow, I never knew it was that easy. I had all these ideas of what I thought God was. Or I had these ideas that I didn't even know were ideas. Like I had said to him, I said, is it okay if I don't think that God is everything right now? And I'll never forget. He said, Jeff, it doesn't matter what you believe. It'll all change. You know, I don't have to know or believe what I think God is or isn't in the beginning. Uh, Sam Shoemaker, early 
AA Oxford Group guy, take the action in disbelief and see what happens. That's my experience. I got I didn't question steps two and three. I needed to start an inventory and get rid of stuff that that was killing me. The way I thought about everything, the way I thought about life. Um, I've come to find out I, I, it's not about learning anything new. I, I don't. The twelve steps don't teach me anything new. It's about unlearning everything that I learned in life. And with that process, something happens. And it's not something I have to struggle to find. It's always here and it always will be. You know, God's presence, God's love is constant. I'm distracted. I can't hear it because my mind wanders. My mind's untamed and it constantly goes backwards and forwards and I'm never present. I'm never here and I can't hear that voice. But when I can set aside certain things and actually take some action to, to hearing the voice, then man, it's, it's not something that I have to go look for, you know, and I never knew that. Um, Before I, sh I share tonight, I, I shared about the amends that, that happened um, earlier today, you know, and, and I, I th again, I think a lot, you know, am I having a current experience in Alcoholics Anonymous? Because I had some unbelievable experiences early on that completely changed my whole life that I know from our history, I cannot rest and I cannot rely upon. You know, Bill has this tremendous experience in the hospital and five months later he wanted to drink in the hotel lobby more work needs to be done right and it, every, after every chapter in our book it constantly just says more action more action more when is it over right and, and it's just the way i am i don't want to do the work every single moment right when i do i experience the promises and when i want to take a day or two break because i'm tired or I, I had softball yesterday, so I don't want to do this today. Like any of that stuff, man. And when that stuff comes up, um, you know, whatever. You know, it is what it is. But am I having a current experience of Alcoholics Anonymous? I'd like to say that I am, but I, I don't know. Like today kind of made things, you know, come full circle again. You know, the amends process, so important. It's completely changed my life. Like, And, and I see it all the time with guys – you know, you, you stay around long enough, you meet a lot of people and people struggle just like I struggled for so many years. And this immense process cannot be taken lightly. You know, I, I have, I had a friend sober two, three years. He, he, you know, ended up drinking again. And, uh, and I just asked him, where are you at with these immense? Like for a guy like me, if I'm constantly living in the past for all this debt that I have and all this stuff that I did in my past, I, if I can't get free of that stuff, I know I will drink again because I'm always living in the past. And when I live in the past, I experience fear. You know, I'm thinking about this or that, this creditor. And what happens? I'm blocked from the power of God because I'm not present. I'm wandering. My mind's back worrying about this or that, right? Um, and that's, and that's where this fear crops up. So, you know, it's important. And I had an opportunity to make these amends, like, you know, and, the financial amends for me are, are very important. Um, anytime, anytime, anytime that my pocket is affected by paying people back, it's important in the spiritual world I've come to find out. It doesn't make sense here because I don't have money to get what I want. But there's, there's a freedom that comes with actually taking that action and, and taking this stuff that I'm attached to out of my pocket and just getting rid of it. There's, there's peace and joy and there's freedom in that. And especially if I owe the person money, you know what I mean? Like they want their money. And, uh, you know, again, the amends process, I went back and I like to think that I'm current on my amends, you know, and then what happens today is, uh, God puts this woman in my life that I hadn't seen in 17 years. And I had the opportunity, you know, I could have just said, Hey, how are you? You look good. Good to see you. And, uh, you know, I hope everything's well and take care. You know, and that would have, I guess that would have been okay. I, I don't think she harbored the resentment like other people I've harmed in my past, you know, but I didn't know. And I just felt that it was necessary and she was on my list. So I made this amends. Um, our, 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 our co-founder, founder, uh, Dr. Bob, 
you know, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm in the AA history. I'm, I'm a nerd like that. So bear with me here. But, uh, from what I gather from reading our, our, our information and, and looking into the history, you know, he met with, uh, Bill and, uh, he didn't want to go through with the amends. He didn't want to go around town to face the people that he had harmed with his drinking and make things right. And from what I gather from the information is, uh, they didn't know where Dr. Bob was. And he was out all day and he comes home back to the house. Bill's ready to roll. He's like, yeah, this, he's, I can't help him. And Dr. Bob came back and, uh, he was all fired up and he went around and he made amends to the people around town that he had harmed from his drinking. And that it was June 10th, 1935. That was Founders Day. That's the start of our fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you, God. You know what I mean? To make things right. Something happens. In my life with God, when I start making things right with the people I have harmed, God makes himself present in my heart without me even knowing. It just happens. So by seating in these people, going back to employers, I screwed a lot of people, you know, in the work, work field. You know, over the holidays, I was in Scranton for a wedding and uh, the previous employer car dealership I worked at for three years, I was able to go back there face to face and uh, held head, head held up high and look these people in the eye and let them know that I was wrong, you know? And uh, I had already paid back the financial to them, but I still felt it was necessary to go back in there directly, face to face, like our book says, made direct amends. It's very important. And uh, like I said, it sounds good, you know, and I'm only motivated to do this stuff because I don't want to drink again, you know? And, and I was told to do it. Like that comes back to, to my willingness. I just did what this man told me to do. I didn't question anything. He could have spoke to me in a foreign language and I still would have taken this action because that's how desperate I was. I needed, I needed a way out and he showed me and I took it. You know, I, I, w- I got with a new man, a new sponsor about three years ago. And this was, and I didn't know what I was signing up for. I said, Hey, Scott, I said, um, can you maybe help me out, you know, with a 10 and 11 a little bit? Um, you know, I want to grow there and, and this and that. And he said, sure. Little did I know he would want me to get with him, call him once a week to do inventory. It's not something I look forward to some weeks. I don't want to look at my selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I just don't, you know, and, but it's necessary for me to stay present. I must stay on guard for certain uh, defects of character. And we all have the same ones, right? And I can take the action that's in the book to, to, to address them or not. It's up to me. It tells us to not rest, you know, and, and we're in trouble if we do, you know, all that good stuff, resting on my laurels. And, uh, you know, and, and again, it's a discipline to take the action daily that's in our, our literature. It's not something that's part of me that wants to do it. I'll kick and I'll scream certain days, but when the pain's great enough, what happens? I'll do it. And that's just the way I am at certain things. The pain has to be great enough for me to t- be motivated to take certain action. <coughs> so I get with this man and I said to him, he showed me some stuff with med- <coughs> excuse me, with meditation and, uh, it was a year or two, year and a half sober, and I, I didn't really have a meditation practice. And he showed me some basic stuff that his sponsor showed him. Very simple. I know in our literature, the 11th step talks about the nightly review in the, in the, in the morning on awakening, and, and they're important to, to do also. Um, but he suggested certain things. And again, am I willing to take this man's direction, his suggestions, and, and apply them in my life? Either I do or I don't. He suggested uh, reading other books. You know, I never knew that uh, I like to read. Never never gave it an opportunity. Just, I forgot, nah, that's not for me. I don't see any reason or logic in reading a book. It just didn't make sense. I never did it growing up. I didn't want to do it in school, so why start now, you know? And I never knew I enjoyed it as much as I do. And I read almost every day. Now, don't get... Don't get it twisted here. <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes before I go to bed. I mean, that's about the extent of it. I, you know, before, uh, I, I find comfort in that before I close my eyes. 
and I just started reading. And uh, a friend of mine, Rob, you know, he is, he shares like this. He goes, if I want to know about cars, sports, what do I do? I read magazines, right? I read read up on stuff to get current, get some information. Well, if I want to know about spirituality and God, maybe it might be an idea to, to pick up a book on the subject. And I would have never figured that one out, you know? So I had to look into certain things. And, man, I never knew I liked to read. And I read all these books. And all this knowledge, again, uh, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, you know? I opened my eyes to some other philosophies on how other people saw the world and how other people and what they believe in uh, to be God, you know? And then what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous? This is the beauty of the program. I can take everything that I gather and I can come up with my own conception of what I believe to be God. Thank you, AA, for that. It doesn't have to be this or that. And that's the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're able to have our own personal relationship with God. It doesn't have to be this or that. And that openness, uh, the, Bill and Bob knew. They knew that had to be the way it was um, for people like us. You know, raise a certain religion like I was. You know, I don't really believe in a lot of that stuff today. And that's okay. You know what I mean? And that's our job in here. And that's the purpose of the book. Uh, everything else in between is great uh, to find a power greater than myself. That's the purpose of the book. And, I, and, and, and through the grace of God, thank you. I found something that I can live by today. Now, in that recovery house, um, the first sponsor I got with, few, uh, I don't even know how long he was sober. Not long. It didn't matter how long he was sober for. He was armed with the facts. He had had an experience with the steps, and I allowed him to show me, right? So we get through the work rather quickly, um, which is not a shock maybe in this group. But uh, within a few weeks, he says, uh, yeah, um, you got to help somebody now. Dude, I just got here. <laughs> I just got out of jail. What are you talking about? I got to get a job. He said, I, I, what do, I don't know what I'm doing. Just show uh, somebody the information that I presented to you. It's in a book. It's highlighted. Just read it to somebody. Now, here's God doing for me what I could not do for myself, because this was not of me the day that this dude comes home from the recovery house. Now, if anybody in here has ever been in a recovery house, halfway house, you know the lingo. You come in from work all burned out, exhausted, life sucks. And my friend felt like this, right? And I... Uh, so I'm getting to work now. I think I'm on to something here, right? Like I'm actually doing something for my recovery. I don't feel like a fraud. I actually am taking certain actions. So I said to him, I said, if you're not too busy, maybe I can show you what my sponsor showed me so far. He says, absolutely. What do we do? We go down in the basement. I'm not his sponsor. I'm a friend. And I just start reading to him what I've learned so far. What happens is... God made himself present in my heart that day in the basement of the recovery house. Sudden, profound experience, spiritual experience that changed my whole life. Now, earlier I had shared that I cannot rest on that experience I had in the basement. I know that to be true today, that that doesn't do me any well today. That experience is great. It sounds good. It's nice to share from the podium. It's not going to keep me sober. 24-hour reprieve. That's all I have. And, uh, you know, that experience, though, it got me moving. It got me motivated because I felt something internally that I never felt before without paying for. I always had to pay to get that feeling, that just that love, that sense of okayness that I felt that day in the basement, man, where I wasn't thinking about me for once. Man, my whole life I'm thinking about myself. And for, for this hour, however long it was, I'm not thinking about myself, and uh, when I'm not thinking about me, I experience joy and, and contentment, right? I, I, it's, I couldn't figure that one out. You know what I mean? It's a parad another one of our paradoxes in, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, so I get out, and I, and, I, and I start helping others, man. And it was a great, it was a great experience. I, don't, I would not change my first year for anything, you know, and I learned a lot, you know, and I learned a lot what not to do. You know, it's one of those things where I just had to learn a lot of things on my own. You know, there's not a lot of stuff that this man was going to show me when it comes to working with others. You know, um, 
what's in the book is great. Chapter seven, uh, how, uh, working with others, you know, that's great, you know, but I had to have a personal experience with it, you know, and, uh, it's a joy today when I'm able to be of service to somebody else and not want anything back, you know, to give freely what was given, you know, and when I take those moments and when I'm able to get past myself, when I'm able to get over myself and just be able to give love and just uh, shed light, you know, I experience uh, joy and peace. And like, again, that's all I ever wanted. I always wanted to be, uh, so what I'm looking for have a purpose. I always wanted to, I think we all do. I want to feel useful and I feel useful today to others, not just alcoholics, you know, most days, you know, it's not every day I'd be lying up here to say, you know, uh, all this great stuff that, you know, I, I have no discomfort and, uh, no hard times. I mean, that's just not the way life is. Life is both the uh, ups and downs. And I, and I was listening to a CD on the way up with my friend, Zach, and uh, chaos and stability, my life goes between the, the two. And that's just the way life is. The people around me are, are never going to stop aging. The uh, situations in my life are never going to stop changing. And that's just the flow of life, right? So stop looking at things the, other than the way they are and just know that this is part of, the, of life. You know what I mean? It's just ups and downs, ups and downs. And it's not that I'm doing something wrong when I'm experiencing discomfort or uncomfortability in my life. It's necessary when I'm experiencing stuff. It brings out to me the part of me that doesn't know God at that moment. And that was from Caroline Mace that I've gotten a lot into over the last year. Um, the parts of me that don't know God, you know, and that's where I struggle at any given moment with certain things, you know. And again, it's not that I'm doing something wrong. It's necessary for me to go through these things. And I never knew that. It's okay to experience discomfort. But for a person like me, I don't want to feel, right? I don't want to go through. I want to get out of it, right? But a part of me has to experience that. It has to go through uh, those those times in my life that I don't want to look at certain things, you know? And that's part of the growth process that I'm starting to to learn through, through ad, um, action, you know, to be okay and to sit in that. And when things don't go the way I think they should, there's a lesson in it. You know, um, got a few minutes here. Uh, don't know what else I'm going to say, but, uh, prayer meditation has changed my life. Um, for the first year, year and a half, I, like I said, my first sponsor really didn't get me. I just wasn't aware of certain things and I, he didn't have an experience to show me, but, my uh, current sponsor got me into this stuff, and I can only say through experience that meditation is the most important thing in my life. Uh, if you ask the old timers uh, back in the day, uh, the first hundred, what is the most important thing in your recovery? And they would tell you morning quiet time. That it just is. I, for me, I cannot just get up, uh, jump out of bed, run right out the door, and think that I'm going to have a good day. I, for some reason, I get the Wawa, and everybody's in my way. I need to get my coffee first, all right? I need to get to where I want to go before you, and there's no peace in that in that lifestyle, in that mindset. Driven by my thinking mind, my, my ego, just constantly wants to go from point A to point B. And if I'm not mindful, and if I don't uh, get on top of this and, and be conscious of the way I'm thinking at any given moment, I have discomfort, you know, and through the process of meditation, and it doesn't, our book doesn't expand on uh, a lot about meditation other than our, like I said, our, our nightly and morning reviews, but uh, I believe it's open for that fact that we all have our own journey when it comes to meditation. What I do, you might not want to do, or you might find a different way to meditate, and that's okay. Uh, through other philosophies, a lot of Eastern philosophy, I found comfort in that. And, and that's what I do, you know, through, through the books that I read and, and the practices that I try to apply, I found comfort in that. Um, never would have thought uh, a couple years ago that I would have been open to yoga. I said it from the podium, okay? <laughs> a, a friend of mine, a uh, girlfriend of mine suggested, why don't you try this? 
okay, I'll do it, right? Uh, thinking that, I, you know, I'm this special guy and I'm on to this stuff. And it's just awesome. It's just, it's done a lot for my being. You know, the whole purpose of meditation, I've come to find out, is to stay centered and not allow all the external stuff to, uh, to get through most times. The world's going to be the way it is, right? The chaos, all that stuff, and, and, and staying centered. And again, the, the moments the, between the, uh, the periods I meditate, I'm able to gain awareness, right, of who I am and what I am. Haven't had a spiritual awakening as a result of these 12 steps. Well, what does that mean? And, I, and we're lucky we're at the hour here in a few minutes where I would go into a metaphysical discussion on what I believe to be a spiritual awakening, right? Um, no, real quick, guys, in closing, you know, I wake up to the fact of what I am, spirit, right? And I try to live in that consciousness that I am more than I think I am, right? I am not what I think I am. So much greater. And uh, I have an ability to stay in contact with this source that I found as long as I take certain attitudes and, and actions. And it's a, and it's a, it's a discipline thing, guys. Like I said, uh, four or five years ago, you, you would have told me, Jeff, you can come in Alcoholics Anonymous. You can stay sober one day at a time and uh, you can have an okay life. I would have signed up for that and I would have been selling myself short. I never knew. Well, if I knew, I probably wouldn't have done it anyway, but I didn't know there was so much more in Alcoholics Anonymous than just not drinking. A life beyond my wildest dream, guys, you know? And again, I, I say that humbly, you know, uh, I, I have ups and downs like anybody else, but I can see that not only with the ups, but also with the downs, that, that God is everywhere in that. And just because I'm, I'm in that mindset where things aren't going the way I think they should, like I said earlier, there's always a lesson in my experience that I need to see something where I need to experience something at that moment that is giving me an opportunity to grow. Um, I'm going to cut it at the hour. I'm not going to run over. Um, again, I want to thank the group for having me come out and speak tonight. It was definitely an honor, and God bless. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.